Welcome to Shireen Conversations. I'm your host, Marjana Paravan. On today's episode, I am joined by Azin Vali, the co-founder of the award-winning multidisciplinary architecture firm, iBeam Design, based in New York, and the founder of Citizen by Azin, a luxury brand that merges fashion with social impact. Her brand, Citizen by Azin, transforms aerial views of cities into wearable art, and the mission is to promote global dialogue by transcending physical and mental borders with her pieces. Her brand has been worn by many celebrities and public figures, like Anusha Ansari, Yara Shahidi, and Tori Birch, to name a few. In addition, her Chicago Citizen gown was accepted as a gift by Michelle Obama. Azin has always known what she's wanted to do and teaches us that being clear with her vision is the first step in building the career or life that we desire. Thank you so much, Azin Jun, for joining me today on Shitting Conversations. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Um, uh, it's a little bit cold where I am. I'm in the Catskills right now in uh, upstate New York. And I have snow. I'm looking out. It's freezing lake. But uh, <laughs> that's why I'm wearing my Tehran scarf around me. And the background you see is also te- uh, the map of Tehran. Well, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I can't wait to dive deeper into that as well. Um, I'm so excited to speak to you at Catskills. I've only been once. I lived in New York for a few years. I've been to Catskills once actually last year, and it's so beautiful. I wish it was during the winter time because I can only imagine how beautiful it is right now. But you went during the summer? I went during, um, actually towards, it was be- like the end of summer, closer to fall. So it was, the weather was changing, but it wasn't winter time yet. No, but it's beautiful. Actually, the fall is really beautiful here. It is beautiful. Yes, I I enjoyed it and I cannot wait to come back. And I can only imagine how beautiful it is. It's probably as beautiful. Yes, I have to. I'm so excited to talk about a little bit about your background, you know, all the incredible things that you do. You hold a degree in architecture. So the fact that I think is so phenomenal about you is that you actually co-founded your architecture firm shortly after graduating. So you hold a degree in architecture from the Cooper Union um, Private School in New York City. And then you went on to co-found iBeam Design and your firm in New York City. So you have an as a design and architecture firm and you hold many awards. I know that sometimes talking to my guests are like, oh my God, I'm getting a little shy that you talk about this. But the fact is it's an award-winning um, firm on both design and architecture. And you've been recognized by New York Magazine for this as well. How did you get your start in architecture? Where was your inspiration to get into this um, field? Um, so let me just again thank you for inviting me to your uh, wonderful podcast. Um, as you know, this is, you know, it's a similar story to a lot of immigrants that have come here, especially uh, in my case, it was uh, just before the revolution that I was here uh, with half of my family, and then they went back. Um, and as I stayed here, I, you know, I was. 15 years old and I was still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up and I always had interest in fashion and in interior design and in architecture in uh, product design in landscape design in um, toy design there was like a million things that was really related to design that I was interested in and I remember I would ask my father you know what is the name of the profession where you can do all of these things? And he would say, honey, well, you know, you can't do it all. You can either be an architect or an interior designer or a fashion designer or a product designer, um, landscape designer. And I was thinking, gosh, God can do it all. Why couldn't I do it? (laughs) Yes. So being, uh, you know, an immigrant struggling at that time, right after the revolution when money you know, was not allowed to leave the country. I thought that probably the most pragmatic profession that I can choose is architecture. And my father being a civil engineer and other relatives we had in, in my family who were architects or engineers, I thought, okay, this is maybe the most pragmatic route to take if I ever one day go back to Iran or if I stay here. And uh, fortunately, I went to a university in Virginia, Virginia Tech. And at that time, it was one of the 
top three schools in terms of state colleges um, um, with regards to architecture and their approach to design and architecture, um, as well as Cooper Union. I later on transferred to Cooper Union um, School of Architecture in New York City. Um, both schools, their approach was kind of like the Bauhaus and you get to learn to understand the fundamentals of design, um, be it through silk screening process or photography or plaster casting or pottery um, or filmmaking. You basically understand the fundamentals of good design and contextualizing uh, you know, uh, an approach to design. So with that, I didn't feel like I was being limited by just doing architecture. Um, it was very exciting. It was very exciting to find that out. Later on, I transferred to Cooper Union School of Architecture, which was a, um, you know, a, a private school, but uh, scholarship based in New York. At that time, it was completely free. Now there is a um, small amount of tuition that you have to pay, but still considering the education you get there, uh, it's way worth it. And um, and at Cooper Union, although their, their approach to architecture was like tough love, it is a very um, tough school. Only 25 people were admitted each year. And of the 25, only half of them usually would graduate. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get accepted. And again, the world of design uh, in a much more rigorous way and a more um, enjoyable way was exposed to me. Um, and that fundamental led me to be able to approach design um, to any field, really, that I wanted. Um, for years, I was interested, um, I mean, since my childhood, I was always interested in fashion, but I never thought it was the, a, a career that I could choose. Um, and when I chose architecture, I was very pleased to see that I can really apply the design principles in a lot of different directions. So that's how I got to studying architecture. And then after I graduated in 1990 and I went back to Iran and I lived there for two years, which I had not done in 14 years. And for me, it was a fascinating experience. It was a, a, a real, pleasure to explore uh, the architecture of Iran, which I had missed in my education. So for those two years, I traveled around Iran and studied the architecture. And I worked for um, a, a boutique firm where they specialized in classical Islamic architecture, which again, this is what I lacked in my formal education here. Um, and uh, and for a little while, I, I formed, I joined my father's firm, and we did some collaborations, which is really great because soon after he passed away, unfortunately. So I had that two years of experience of living and working with him, which was a treasure for me. Um, and then when I came back, um, I connected with an old classmate of mine, Suzanne Wines. And we remembered and we reminisced about the projects uh, that we collaborated on at school. And there was a competition that was coming up. And I said, well, um, why don't we enter this competition? And uh, at the time I was married uh, to my, my husband, who was also an architect who went to the same school with us. And he didn't show any interest of entering the competition. And Suzanne, uh, said that her father, who is a well-known architect himself, happened to be on the jury of that competition. So she said, well, you know, we would be disqualified. I cannot enter the competition. And I said, well, why don't we just do it anonymously and, and, and not tell anybody that we're doing it and, and see what happened. Well, let's just do it for fun. And we entered this competition of a small traffic island in, in Manhattan that uh, the parks department wanted to turn into a little park. And we looked at it and we said, well, you know, we're entering this competition almost kind of illegally. Um, we might as well break all the rules. So we went beyond the borders of this 
of the of the perimeter of the competition and we looked at the traffic island more as a big um piazza as in italian piazzas and we thought we connect all sides of the street to it we create a big hanging garden extending cables from people's window cases giving them flower boxes so they can grow the garden from above creating a canopy wow. of ivy and then we grow the city can grow the garden from down below so we uh, looked at this traffic island was in the middle of three different distinct neighborhoods of Soho, Little Italy and Chinatown. And we thought, well, these cables, this canopy can be an exhibition space for Soho artists. It can be a, a, a celebration of San Gennaro Festival for the Italians as they normally hang uh, lights uh, from the cables and also lanterns for Chinese New Year so the Chinese can celebrate their New Year's. So we thought of it not just a little traffic island that needs to be revamped, but as a node within the city where the different communities that are surrounded by this island can come and celebrate their culture and have festivities and activities. And it would be a public and private collaboration between the residents above and the city from below. And so we got really excited, we did the competition and it turned out that the one um, uh, submission that was unanimously voted for was ours and we won the competition. That is incredible. So, yeah, uh, so uh, th that says something about breaking the rules, you know? You have Absolutely. to go with with your passion and what you believe is the right thing to do and uh, and after that we enjoyed so much that collaboration that we said hey you know why don't we start a firm together very naively <laughs> i this entire i'm so connected to everything that you mentioned i mean it all makes sense because like you said when you were at virginia tech you were there from the 1984 to 86 and I mean, as an architect, my sisters are architects. I have twin sisters who went to USC and they obviously graduated a few years back where everything is technology-based. I mean, you're the time where you're using your hands, you're creating blueprints. So design yeah. is in your blood. And so when you went to Cooper Union and you went to a school that really focuses on architecture and art, you applied those principles in different ways. And so that makes sense. Going back to Iran in those years, working with your father, you applied those principles and you saw and appreciated, I'm sure, things like you said, the formal education didn't teach you. You saw things in a different way and yeah. breaking the rules. I, I think that's such a telling thing for now, day and age for people, because now, nowadays people are like, let's break the rules in any way, shape or form. But in the nineties, I mean, rebellion was a thing that was coming about, but you don't hear it as often as someone who lived on Bowery and Delancey, I can say that now because I don't live there anymore. Oh. I know exactly what you're talking about. So I wish I was there during the time when I can see all of this applied, but I see it. I was there during the festival, the Ita Little Italy, all of this. So that's oh. so incredible. That's good. But it all makes sense. Yeah. You know the city that well, and you know that neighborhood, you know exactly because, you know, exactly. during the San Gennaro festivals, that's and, and prior to all those years that the Italians lived in Little Italy, um, you know, the, the culture of spanning uh, light fixtures as well as hanging clothes dry. Yes. It's always been in that culture. And same thing with the Chinese hanging lanterns. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was just, a, a very meaningful competition and I'm so happy that that was the beginning of our uh, forming of our firm. I and love that story. I just love that all of that and it, make, it makes a lot of sense why from there I mean I love that we're you know where you're we're going because like not only are you in the architect you're also designer in different ways in the fashion industry like you're able to say like you told your father if God can do it why can't I? Because you extended your design skills as someone who draws, who is artistic in that way and your knowledge of it further. And you designed your own collection of luxury fashion and accessories brand and Citizen, which I think is one as someone who is a meaning behind a name, like Sheeting Conversations being my grandmother's name, Citizen being spelled with a Y, like city, mm -hmm. you pay tribute to the cities and the landscape and the architecture within your designs. And I think that's so phenomenal. And being the background of what you have right now in your, um, in your, uh, the Zoom 
that we have and what you're wearing being the Tehran dress. I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because I know that your mission is a little bit more than just creating something luxurious and something that's artistic. There is so much more that's behind your brand as well, that your mission is to promote a global dialogue and diplomacy through fashion. Can you explain a little bit about that and how the two are married together? Um, sure. I think uh, before that, I have to say how Citizen was formed. Yes. Um, and uh, it started out because we were um, uh, nominated to uh, submit a proposal to the Museum of Modern Art for, um, for an exhibition. And the exhibition was to deal with the future of urban planning. And this happened at the time when the, where the foreclosure crisis were happening and the model of housings as we knew it then were not working. It was causing an economic collapse. So the idea was, you know, we were to submit a, 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 a proposal to be included in that exhibition. And um, I was doing research on all these cities with high foreclosure rates. And as I was looking at these cities, you know, through Google Map, looking at the um, the structure of the urban planning in these cities of Nevada, cities in Florida, Newark, New Jersey, even New York City, California, Los Angeles, um, I was just mesmerized as I've always been uh, flying in. You know, from when I was fourteen years old, I flew into the U.S. looking at these cities from above and and fascination with maps. I've always been interested in the landscapes and, and maps. And I thought, why not show the beauty of this place and, and, and create a way that you can fundraise uh, in support of these causes, in support of, of the uh, foreclosure crisis. And then I thought, well, you know, I want to, uh, I want to wrap myself in this landscape. And I want to do more with this landscape. Um, and um, so that led to the creation of the, my aha moment of finally doing a fashion line based on something that is meaningful to me uh, on so, so many levels. Uh, because prior to that, to get into fashion industry, I feel like this is not something that I could really pursue and create collections year after year, a few times a year. And for what purpose? I feel like there's so much fashion, so much clothing that's out there, disposable fashion really. Um, and I don't see the point of it. And I don't see myself getting involved in fashion from that angle. But I feel like, okay, this is something that I can connect to on the design level. I can connect to on um, political level. I can connect to on nostalgic, emotional, historic levels uh, uh, on, on so many levels. So I started the, the fashion brand Citizen by Azine. At first it was about making some bags. Then it went into making scarves because it was much easier than bags. And then it was the clothing, which is much more difficult, where the clothing are designed from the topography of each city, where a river can form a strap in a dress or a um, uh, or a seam and a road can end in a seam mountains could form ruffles in a skirt or a neckline um, so the idea of letting the landscape to design the dress rather than the other way around was much more interesting to me as it is in my architecture work I research the context and I allow the design to emerge from a context of a situation, be it, be it the site, be it the client, hobbies, habits, desires, um, the, where the sun sets, where the sun rises, the view, you know, all of that goes into consideration when you're designing a space. And I was so happy that, you know, I can have a, an alphabet in a way that tells me what the design of each garment may be. And that's how I started uh, launching Citizen by Azine. And I started out with Tehran because that's the place I wanted, you know, to wrap my body with and, you know, to feel closest to. 
the place I, that I love most, both Tehran and New York, the two cities that I consider home. And funny enough, at that time, we one of our projects, um, it was a interior um, uh, residence in New York City, it was a loft that had just finished. And we had participated in Open House, which is a program where um, different architectural uh, other houses or commercial spaces become open to the public once a year for people to come. It's usually during a weekend in the fall to come and view it in person. And you have to sign up for it. And there are limited number per hour that people can come in. And we, we were just launching that project. And as guests were coming to look at the space, I had just finished my Tehran dress and I had worn that dress that day. And I was getting as many compliments on the dress as I was getting on the space. So I thought, oh, I think I'm up to something here. So uh, I continued with that. My two favorite dresses are Tehran and New York, as I mentioned. And um, back to your question, which was? <laughs> no, that I, I, everything that you mentioned is a part of the question is, you know, I, you know, can you explain to us a bit about behind your brand? And that is explaining a bit about behind your brand. And the thing about it is I wanted to create, um, so every year I create uh, about 15 scarves. Uh, and that's the most accessible part of the brand. The clothing is custom made and it's quite involved and quite expensive. Um, but the, the scarves are a, kind of a mini version of a clothing item and it's more accessible. It's um, anyone at any age, any race, any ethnicity, any religion can relate to the scarf. The scarf is a unifying article of clothing that around the world, men, women, old, young, you know, variety of uh, uh, religions are used to wearing. So I thought how poetic that, you know, we can connect to people through this one article of clothing and, and hopefully promote peace and dialogue through the arts. As you know, Iran has always been in the news. And this is another way for me to connect to Iran in a way that I've, you know, I've always had to dispel misconceptions about Iran and about the US when I'm there. So it's, it just made sense that I felt like um, we can try to bring people together through the arts and fashion is one uh, component of that. Loved everything that you said about that. I even love the fact that you said that you created the Tehran dress because it was the one piece before New York. I mean, obviously, like you said, they're both your homes, but the one piece that you wanted to wrap yourself around. Um, I think that is the most beautiful thing I heard because for those that have left the country that they knew that was their home, to be able to have something accessible, whether it's the dress or the scarf, like you said, to be able to have that and style that the way that is that makes the most sense to them and because we know fashion has no limits you can take anything and create it in a way that makes the most sense to you but to be able to have a piece of that close to your heart that represents where you're from is beautiful and I think that most incredible thing about your brand is that it has been worn by many celebrities on the red carpet I know that Anusha Ansari has worn it Yara Shahidi has worn it Ariana Huffington Tori Birch just to name a few and that you actually created a special dress the Chicago dress that you gifted to Michelle Obama how does that make you feel to be known that not only these individuals are wearing pieces of art that you created on the red carpet but also the fact is a second part of that question is that you were also named as one of the most, um, you know, female entre successful female entrepreneurs on a New York um, when you were featured on a TV show um, mm -hmm. back in 2000. Yes, I believe in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. How does that make you feel to, you know, you're someone who, that wanted to create in the beginning. I, how can I not do all of these things? You have done all of these things in the short amount of time in your career. I feel like you've done a lot but you have so much more to do and you've done it. How does that make you feel? It's never enough. <laughs> it's never yeah. enough for me. I'm never satisfied. I'm never satisfied with myself. And I always feel like I have a long way to go. And um, 
a lot to cover mm -hmm. and yeah so it's uh, I'm, I'm always most critical of myself and um maybe that gives me in a way maybe the will to go and keep going but i don't know everything also has its time yeah um right now for instance i you know during the pandemic uh i put a little bit of a pause on on citizen because i felt like you know this is not the focus of the world right now and another is it of mine and i come back to it when i'm ready for it and I do create pieces, you know, I was really grateful for Yara Shahidi that um, partnered with me in promoting the Kerman Shah scarf when there was an earthquake there, because mm -hmm. um, I do like to create pieces that help to raise funds and awareness about various issues. And um, that was a great moment. And I've had, um, you know, uh, I was also really grateful that uh, Anusha Ansari um, contacted me and asked me if there was anything that she could wear in representing um, uh, Mr. Farhadi, who is, oh, by the way, one of my favorite filmmakers out of Iran. Um, and particularly because the way he portrays his films where the protagonist is never clear whether they're um, a villain or a hero. Yes. That's the balance in in life and in diplomacy that you know you can always look at a situation from a different angle and unless you've looked at it all in 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 multiple angles you cannot have the full picture of the situation and you cannot pass judgment on anyone or any place unless yeah. you immerse yourself in that um, and put aside your prejudice prejudices so it was a great honor for me to dress Anusha Ansari for such a great um, uh, director. It was like all the stars had lined up uh, on that day. And Anusha called me like two days before the event. She called me and said, hey, I know this is last minute, but do you have something I can wear? And I said, oh my God, <laughs> you know, that's a great honor, but you know, you know, what's your size? Where, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Mashhad. I said, I don't have a Mashhad dress, but I have a Mashhad, you know, uh, top uh, or scarf that let me see what I can do with it. And and um, so I hung up the phone. It was eight o'clock at night on a Friday, New York time. The Oscars was on Sunday. And I like, I got on the phone, I started looking for stylist in the, in LA and makeup artist, um, hotel, got found out where, which hotel she's staying at and um, looked for a flight. I just took a bunch of stuff with me, got on the flight at seven in the morning wow. <laughs> to LA and organized the shoes, the dress, the, 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 the hair and makeup and the accessories, the jewelry. And, um, and it all came together uh, beautifully at the end. And I was so glad that she was wearing the city where she was from, uh, Mashhad, representing uh, that wonderful uh, evening that we were all very proud of. I love that, you know, and I, the one thing I want to point out that I, like you said, it's not enough. There's so much more. One thing I did want to ask you, and, and one thing I did say, it's like a short time in your career. Most people might listen to me and be like, what do you mean? She's been doing this since like the nineties, short time in her career. That's like 30 plus years. So it's a long time. But what I think is someone like you, and you mentioned it perfectly right after I said that it's not enough. There's so much more I can see. You're, you're always thinking about the next bigger thing or what more can you do? You're thinking about how you can help. Everything that you're doing is to help. It's not necessarily to, you know, everyone thinks about profit in a sense, but you're also thinking about like the political way. How can I bring awareness to the things that are happening? Like you said, the Yara Shahidi, the earthquake that happened. Something is beautiful. People are seeing a photo, but what is more deeper in this photo? There's something else that's deeper in this creation that you created. There's bringing awareness to things in cities that people don't recognize on a daily basis. And that's what I mean by the short time in your career, because I can see you going, expanding further and further out on all these years. So, years. <laughs> no, I hope so. That's what my it, question it, it is. is. 
Well, this is the thing about fashion is a much more uh, quicker process than it is with architecture. That's what mm. I really That's enjoyed true. about it. You can design something and in two weeks time, you have it versus That's in architecture, true. you know, I just finished the project. My last project took uh, four years to build. Wow. And it's uh, around not immediate. No, so it, it's a very long um, time consuming process, but it's like raising a child or giving birth to a child. It, it just takes a long time. Um, and uh, so interesting enough, the project that I finished um, is a, a fashion logistics company um, that houses all the, the great fashion uh, brands, especially European brands like Chanel's and the Dior's and the Yves Saint Laurent's uh, and, and they're in charge of the logistics and um, their warehouses and their office space. It took four years to build that. So wow. <laughs> versus like two weeks or a month, yeah. I might take a custom dress to be made. Um, so from that angle, yeah, fashion, doing fashion is a lot more um fun to do you're dealing with fabrics and everything but i love doing architecture as well and interior design i in general what i love most and the, the common denominator between these two is the idea of transforming someone's um uh, someone's uh, state of being whether they're experiencing a space and that transforms them and, and makes them happy, or they're putting on a garment that makes them feel beautiful. That's a really great way of saying it. It's feeding both sides of what you're, you're looking for, right? Like you said, like creating a building that takes four plus years, but you're also creating some way of a, a garment that could be two weeks to a month. Um, you're still creating what you're is in your mind um, and you're feeding both sides of the puzzle for yourself. So what's next for you? I mean, I know, like you said, there's so much more that you'd like to do, but what is next, whether it be for citizen, I know that there was a pause because of the pandemic and it wasn't the core focus of what's going on in the world or what is next for I-Beam Design? Um, well, with regards to I-Beam Design, uh, now uh, that I have moved to the Catskills, uh, my partner and I are, um, separating. Mm -hmm. um, we will be probably collaborating again. So I am going to be starting a, a, a citizen designs company, which focuses on uh, architecture and interior design. So it's a, it's a branch off of Citizen by Azine, which does clothing and citizen designs which does architecture and design. Um, and with regards to citizen, I will always continue to have uh, new cities in my collection of scarves, which is that's the bread and butter of the company. Um, and always there will be one city from Iran and one city from America. So that's the number one thing. And hopefully one day we can bring them together. <laughs> yes, you're tying the scarves together to bring them together. <laughs> um, and then I'm always open for custom orders. So it, it's really nice to you know um hear from people who want to feel their heart and soul be connected to a place that they love it's a way of bridging uh that's that relationship or that emotion i think that's such a beautiful thing and so for those that want to reach out to you for those custom orders or to still appreciate what you have and order those scarves they can go onto your website at citizenbyazine.com and for those that are listening it's citizen with a y so c i t y z e n by b y a z i n.com before for i anyone who's interested in doing architecture they can yes. still go to go to my website at, um, uh, but they can reach me at a zine at i dash beam as in structural beam design.com thank you and before i say goodbye to you if there's anything that you can share with my audience that you had wished that maybe had been shared to you like advice is there anything that has stuck out with you that you can close us off with you know i, I don't know if i'm 
the best like a business advisor to give it to doesn't someone. have to be business can, it could be I anything can, i can say that i have always um followed my passion and and i'm blessed that i don't have confusion about my life this is what i do this is what i know how to do this is what i like to do i'm not lost i was never lost i knew from my childhood that i want to be involved in design of some sort so uh, I'm, I'm really blessed. So it's really important for younger kids to know what it is that they love doing and be the best at it as they can possibly be. And, uh, and just have, um, you know, focus on that and, um, and just follow your dream. It's, it sounds cliche and it's necessary. It isn't. Sometimes it's not necessary. It's not necessarily the right path to take for some people. And there are a lot of struggles along the way. It definitely is not easy. And both professions have a lot of challenges with them. But as long as you're passionate about it, because you spend more than eight hours to 12 hours a day on your job, you might as well love it. I 100% agree. As someone who does marketing, and I do consulting right now with different brands, I always say I need to understand the brand. I understand the bread and butter, the backbone of the brand, because you have to be passionate about what you're marketing, what you're creating, what you're building, what you're doing for those eight hours a day. So you're, it's as simple. And like you said, it's not cliche, because it's so simple. But you have to love what you're doing. And don't overcomplicate it. Um, don't, go into a field because you think necessarily money is the driving force behind it because you can make money doing things that you love doing. So I love that you said that. Thank you so much, Azim Thank, Thank, Thank you so for much taking for the time. Yes, it's such Absolutely. a pleasure speaking to you and, uh, and I look forward to listening to your podcast. Yes. Thank you. For more inspiring interviews, head on over to shittingconversations.com. If you like today's show, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review and follow on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sheeting Conversations. You can also watch episodes on YouTube. I'm Majina Paravon, and you've been listening to Sheeting Conversations. Thank you.